Good morning. It is so great to have you with us today. It's so great to see your faces. And if you're joining us online, we are so happy that you are here to worship with us today. Um, before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, Wednesday night meals have been going great this week. Uh, they will start at 6 as usual. We have a sign up that's over here in the, the entrance way. And uh, youth will start at 6.30. Adults and children start at 7. So come out and join us on Wednesdays because we've been having lots of fun. Um, this Saturday, the 17th, we'll have a children's ministry meeting. Starts at 10 a.m. If you help with children in any way, uh, nursery, children's church, Sunday school, uh, we're going to be talking about some of those things as well as our summer schedule. So if you want to help with Vacation Bible School, or you want to know more about Kids Camp, which we're super excited we get to do that this year, um, please plan to join us on Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, and then our final announcement, we're just so grateful for your continued giving to the church. We appreciate it so much. There are a couple different ways that you can give. We have offering plates at each of the doors here. You can drop a check or cash in that way, or you can give online through our push pay. Um, up here, you'll see the, the number to text um, that you can give online. But this morning, let's look at Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured out on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning so grateful that we have the opportunity to worship you. We gather in this place, or even from where we are watching online, and we just say, Lord, we invite your presence to be among us. Help us to set any distractions aside so that we can focus on you. Lord, we're here for you. Help us to be obedient, to listen, and to hear your voice. Lord, we love you this morning, and we thank you for these ways that we get to worship you. So open our hearts and help us to praise you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and worship.
goodness to us. Lord, you are faithful and you are gracious and you chase after us even at times when we run from you. So Lord, we say thank you this morning. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor because you are the one true God and you deserve all of it. So Lord, as Pastor Gavin comes this morning and shares your word with us, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say through him. Lord, open our ears and help us to be a changed people, to not leave this place the same. and we take that with us everywhere we go. We are your people and you are our God. So we thank you for this day and this morning. We just ask that you would continue to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, kids, kindergarten through fifth are released for Children's Church. Good morning, church. Risen. That's right. He is risen. Thanks be to God. We're so happy that you're with us this morning for worship. If you're following along online or, you know, in three days online, uh, we want to let you know that you're welcome as well and find us at our website if you need more information, vvnaz.org. Otherwise, if you're here, um, we're happy to be in the house of God together to worship, to focus on the Word, and to just ask that the Lord would transform us and be transformed. Our goal every single time we get together should be that we leave differently when we go out. And that's my prayer and my hope for us this morning. You know, I um, was reading up on this passage uh, throughout the week, and it, I, a folk, you ever remember folk tales? There was a particular folk tale that came to my mind, and I, I couldn't help but share it with you. I'm kind of a fan of folk tales. I realize sometimes they're, if you read like the non-children's version, they can be graphic or scary. But there's one in particular that, I, that came to my mind and it changed how I thought about it. And so this one's called Stone Soup. Have you, do, you, do you know this one, Stone Soup? Right? So there's, there's a traveler going through a village or you know, a town and he gets through and, and he's been traveling a long time and he doesn't have any food or anything, any place to stay. And he goes knocking on door, uh, the doors of houses and he goes from door to door and, and nobody will take him in. No one will give him anything to eat. And so he's wandering around and moping around and he sees this pot kind of out maybe behind a house, maybe it's dented or old or yucky, I don't know, for whatever reason it's out there. So he gathers some wood and starts a fire and he's got this pot going and it's boiling and people are starting to see what this, you know, this stranger is doing out in the middle of town cooking this pot. And so they come to look and they see and they're looking and he's pouring rocks in and, and, and different stones and, and they say, what are you doing? He said, well, you've never had stone soup? Oh, it's delicious. And he starts to mm, taste it, which is just warm water, right? So he starts to taste it, and, and, and then people say, well, can, can we have some? Can we try it? We've never had stone soup, so he lets them try, and they say, hmm, you know, this could use an onion. And so someone runs back to their house and gets an onion and puts it in. And someone else says, well, that just tastes like onion water. And so they go get a carrot, and, and, and then before long, potato, and somebody puts a piece of meat there and before long you have a big pot of stew and everybody from the whole town is out eating from this stew and when I heard this story I thought why are they telling us of a good trickster like how to trick people into feeding you and I never really it never really picked up the moral of the story until we got into the passage and so I will tell you exactly what I think about that after we read this passage um, so let's read from Acts chapter 4 verse 32 to 35 just um Four short verses for us this morning. Well, no. I actually extended it to 37, so there's, there's a few more, all right? Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands 
uh, or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And this is the word of the Lord for the people of God. You know, when I, as I mentioned, when I was a kid and I heard this stone soup story, I kind of thought, I don't get it. I don't understand. How, why are they telling us about this guy who was able to trick people? But as I was reading through this the passage and, and praying about it and, and, and meditating on it, and the more this story just came to my mind and I realized it's not really a story of a guy being able to trick people well or get what he wants or manipulate people. It's a story of, of there being a need. And every person who saw this need and said, I by myself, I can't really do anything. Maybe, maybe my house can't take on a stranger, but it can offer an onion, right? Maybe my house can't house somebody or can't put somebody up for the night uh, because whatever reason, we don't have any spare room, or whatever it may be, but we can contribute in this way. And, and what we find in this story is an amazing example of if we all contribute to one another, we're able to provide for everybody's needs. You know, gift giving is something that is different, it, it, culturally speaking, is something that's different around the world. I know that, um, I know that when, um, when you have a birthday, you kind of expect that people might give you gifts, right? That's kind of a normal thing, um, especially when you're younger, right? You expect, what, what am I going to get for my birthday? And, and, and God help the parent who forgets to get a gift for their child on their birthday, right? They'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> but um, I know that when we arrived in Congo, our gift-giving ideas were turned upside down because whenever you were a visitor to some place, you were given a gift, Visitors received gifts, and, and the way that I had learned was if I was going to go and stay in somebody's home, if I was going to go visit someplace, I would come and bring a small gift to them. And this created some weird dynamics in that culture. Um, if you give somebody a gift, they are kind of obligated to return the favor in some way. And so if you meet somebody in your home, you're expected then to kind of uh, you're expected to go on a visit and, and give them the chance to feed you. Otherwise, you have this unequal balance. And I think some of that um, existed in Jesus' time as well. I know, man, we got all kinds of gifts when we visited places. Um, Macy got really good at holding chickens because we would just get a gift and, and, and Macy would be like, here, take this chicken. And so Macy would be holding chickens as we're in there, um, you know, standing in front of the church or wherever we were. And, and, one kind of example that makes sense to us of this as well is, is um, the practice of giving a dowry, right? We don't do this anymore, um, and it's kind of reversed. In, in the African culture, the, the man pays a dowry to the, to the wife's family. Um, in European culture, where many of us uh, originate from, or at least we think about when we think about dowries, um, it was the man uh, who received the dowry, right? Uh, and so it was a different thing. But what this does today is gift giving creates a series uh, uh, or a system of indebtedness in some parts of the world. We give gifts and therefore not only am I indebted to somebody who has gifted me, but that person is probably indebted to a number of other people who had to raise the money up uh, in order to give me this good gift. So all of this to say, gift giving has gone awry. Our understanding of what it means to be a culture of people who give out of a generous and hospitable spirit, who give freely because Jesus Christ gave to us freely His love and His grace, His hope that we have for a future, that has been lost in some sense. And so if the world is going to get a proper sense of gift giving back, then it's going to have to be the church that shows that and models that. So in this story talks about or uh, not the story, but the passage talks about the, 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 the first believers, right? The, the New Testament church, the most pure and un, um, undefiled or unchanged version of the faith that was handed over from Jesus Christ himself to the world exists in that New Testament church. And here's an example of it. Nobody had any needs. They brought their stuff freely and gave them out to others. And then we have this story of Barnabas. 
Joseph, who the disciples named Barnabas. He comes, he sells a piece of land, he gives the money. But we remember the next part of the story, don't we? The part that we didn't read. Then we have Ananias and Sapphira who show up, and they're like, hey, you know, Barnabas got some honor and some recognition when he did this. Now we're going to do the same thing. And so we see that they, they decide, they make a plot, they're going to sell this piece of land, and then they're going to give some of it. Or to the, to the needs of the, the, when we talk about church, we're talking about community, right? The, the group of people. So they're going to give some. And so they did that, and we know how the story goes. Uh, they ask him, is this, uh, is this all that you received? Is this the price that you received? And then he falls down dead after lying, and his wife comes in. And he gets carried out and buried, and his wife comes in, and um, she's asked the same question. Was this the amount of money that you agreed, uh, that you sold the land? Is this the agreed upon amount? She says yes. She also falls down dead. And then horror runs through, through the congregation, right? Everyone's out filling out their tithe checks this morning, right, after that. But that's not about, it's not about are you giving everything in your bank account to the church. That's not what it is. It's not saying that, you're not allowed to have any extra possessions. The idea was that the Spirit of God moved a couple to sell a piece of land and give that money to the church to receive in the same way um, the funds that had been helping them to provide for all those who were needy, all those stone soup uh, people who were searching for stone soup, right? They gave it to all those people, and yet somewhere in their hearts they decided, yeah, we did sell the land, but we're going to keep some of it for us. And so the issue is less about we're not allowed to have any money in our bank accounts and more about if the Spirit moves upon you to do something and you respond deceitfully or respond in a way that perhaps would get you honor and glory and power amongst your peers or your church family, then you have grieved the Spirit. Then you have sinned against the Spirit. And those consequences can be severe. So we should be, our gift giving should be motivated by a spirit of unity and love as opposed to division or deception. There is a difference between our motivations and our, and our outcomes. And I know that we can get, if anyone's a philosophy major out there, they'll say, well, those are the same thing. Um, it depends on who you follow, right? But, but really, what the Spirit motivates us to do is one thing, and what we actually end up doing is another. So if we came in to say that we're going to start a new program at church, and somehow that alienated half the people and they all left, somehow that, even if, really, even if uh, we really felt as a church leadership or myself, we really felt like this was the way the Lord wanted us to go, that was probably not a faithful um, manifestation of what the Spirit was asking us to do. And so anytime we cause division or, or hurt, we need to take a step back and look and see, did I do this right? Did I handle that situation well? Did I respond faithfully to the Spirit as it was moving? Because you see, what's happening here is, is Christianity is recreating an understanding of what the family is. The family used to be flesh and blood right? This is my family, flesh and blood. And that's why adoption was such an amazing aspect or reminder of, of who God was, because somehow we said, this person who is not of my blood is now inheriting all the rights of my name, of my blood, of my family. They will forever be a part of me in the same way as any biological children would be. And this is why God uses that uh, analogy of adoption throughout the Old Testament saying, you were not my people, now you are. I have adopted you. And, that, and Paul carries that same thing on. And, and we have all been adopted into the family of God so that we are now co-heirs of that spiritual inheritance. And that is a reason to say amen. So we are creating a new family with the church. If there's anyone who's going to testify to the truth of the gospel, the fact that Jesus Christ was or is the Son of God, He was born and lived upon this earth, He was crucified, and He is risen. If we believe that, the church is the place where we have to live that out in such a way that people say, He is risen. It is true. Jesus Christ is alive, and we see it in the life of the church. 
we do that by caring for people who are not of our blood, and yet we treat them as if they were. We do that by caring for one another and bringing those, those, those tithes and those offerings together, laying them at the apostles' feet or laying them at the, we don't know if we want to say at the church board's feet or at the pastor's feet, but bringing those offerings in so that the church may be able to help uh, supply for the needs of the community, but also so we may continue finding ways to proclaim that Jesus Christ is risen out in the world out in our community. You see, we do have this image that they were giving absolutely everything that they owned to the church. And this is, again, this is to the community, not to some building or some group. This was the, the, all those who had faith in Jesus Christ. We have this idea, they were bringing it all and giving it. And sometimes I think about that and I think, is this really, Lord, what it means? Is this really what they want? They want us to empty out our retirement they want us to empty out everything that we have and bring it all to church. Well, I'll tell you what, we would have probably a lot less physical needs, but is that really what it's saying? And I think about it, and I, and I pray about it, and I look what other authors have said and, and, and read in commentaries, and there's probably a million different answers to, to that question. But what, what we know is those New Testament early church believers, they understood that Jesus was coming back at any moment. Jesus was gone. He said, I'm coming back, but for now, I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. And we'll celebrate that at Pentecost here in a few weeks. But, but as he did that, the disciples understood that Jesus is coming back soon. We can't delay. Let's not be burdened by anything of the past. If you have ancestral land that's been in your family for hundreds and hundreds of years, you might as well sell it because you're not going to need it in a while, and we can use that to reach more people with the good news. If you've got four homes, which, to be honest, the wealthy people probably had many more than four homes back in this time, let's start selling them. You don't need all those other homes. Sell them. Bring the money together. Then we'll be able to be the church. And so this was the mindset. Jesus is coming back soon. And the timing of things is funny. I received a, a pamphlet, a little booklet in the mail. It just said to the pastor of Valley View Church in Nazarene. I said, okay. I opened it up. I started reading about it. And it told me that Jesus is coming back in 2033. I need to get ready. And I need to get my people ready because Jesus is coming back. And I thought, I said, you know, that would be interesting. If Jesus was coming back in 2033 and there was all these different scripture prophecies and reasons why this was the case and they, you know, we need to get people ready for the rapture that's happening in I think it was June. So just so you know, June 3rd, 2033, that's the end. But I started looking at it and thought, you know, that would be fun. Wouldn't life be simpler? Wouldn't it be simpler if we know that we had 12 years before Jesus came back? We could just start liquid stuff. I would be giving clothes away. You know, so I have, you can ask my wife, I have shirts probably usually for about 15, uh, 12 minimum years before I get rid of them. So uh, there's some shirts I just won't need anymore right? Because I've, I've got the clothes I have now are all that I need. I can start doing all kinds of things that I won't need to worry about. Wouldn't life be easier if we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus was coming back in June of 2033? That would be easy. I would love, I would love to be able to have that kind of certainty. Unfortunately, the Bible tells us that we won't know the date or the time. But you see, what's so interesting about that is the fact that that those people, those first disciples and the apostles, those first Christians, they were living that way. They were living as if there were no tomorrow. Normally we say that when there's like some reckless kid driving down the road at 100 miles an hour and a 40 mile an hour speed limit or something. We say, that guy's living like there's no tomorrow. Wouldn't it be amazing if that was how we lived? Reminds me of that, if you're a country fan, reminds me of that song, to live like you were dying and you just go off and do all the things you've been been ready to do or been wanting to do, but you just never felt like you were ready. So the message or the gospel message for today isn't let's all be crazy and just blow through our cash and, 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 and if you're not giving all your money to the church, uh, everything you have, then you're a sinner. That's not what the message is. The message is we need to figure out in our context 2,000 years after Christ, a little less than 2,000 years after Christ uh, was crucified and left, what does it mean to be the family of God here today in this time and this place? Are there some, um, some ways that we can recreate what it means to be a family? I think we're doing that. I think we testify to that. Eating together is one way. Spending time together in worship is one of the oldest ways we have done that as a church. 
uh, serving those around us, people who aren't necessarily a part of our community, some who are, and, and, and having the food pantry um, and the clothing boutique and other ways that people come and, and some of the things that we do around the holidays, all those are, tes- are testimonies or continue to testify to the fact that we are a family that looks to the future and that looks beyond ourselves, and that is a testimony to who Christ is. The the disciples of Jesus Christ, if that's you and me, even today, we're still His disciples, and all those who come after us will be His disciples. We are called to, after His death, to be His followers up until the point that we encourage one another to live in harmony. We are called to be a tightly knit community that bears evidence of the gospel message, the truth of the gospel message. It is strange for those who are looking in and yet desirable as well. I've seen a church community so faithful that people look into it and they say, those guys are weird. But at the same time, they say, it sure would be nice to get some of that. And that is the kind of community that I think we want to be, one that is looking out beyond ourselves, one that is modeling love and affection and care. And yes, that's financial, but it's more than that and much more than that. A community that models those things in such a way that others looking outside might say, that's weird, but I, I want to get some of that. I want to be a part of that. So as opposed to an honor-shame culture, which might have existed in, in Jesus' time, where those who gave were then now also expected to, uh, to receive later, we think about um, any person who would have come and, and, and made a big public display of an offering Um, at the disciples' feet, um, they had to let go of any cultural notion that now somehow I'm also going to be in charge or I'm also going to receive power or I'm going to receive something because of this. They had to let that go. In the same way, we have to think of when we give to others, when we do something, when we have a program for the kids, whether it's fall or, or, or Easter or whatever we're doing, VBS, when we do that, do we expect something in return? There's this phrase that we would say um, whenever, whenever we were talking about doing something for the church and, and we would say, well, that's just going to add another jewel to my crown. But if, we ever, if you're ever just doing something for the sake of adding a jewel to your crown, I'm not sure that our hearts are in the right place and we're doing things for the right reasons. Remember that our intentions and motivations are so... Um, caught up in the actual outcome of what we do as well. And so our our hearts have to be in the right place. We have to allow ourselves to be moved by the Spirit. In a a world or in a culture or in a community, uh, in a society rather, that says um, you need to buy more, you need to buy bigger, you need to be wealthier and stronger and more powerful, you need to have more, 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 We need to be a people who are willing to say, I can be a people of less. That's why the church has had for a long time, and not just this church or the church in Nazarene, the church has had for a long time uh, an understanding that we give 10%. And that comes from some scriptural references, but not not really quite direct on how much you should give. But the church has held for a long time 10%. Because 10% is a significant number. If you're a financial person, you'll know that you're supposed to save 10% and invest 10%. Well, now if you're, if you're a Christian, a financial person, maybe we add you're supposed to also uh, tithe 10%. So now you're living on 70%. What does that mean? Man, I don't know. But what I do know is that the more that we rely on money, the more that we will need. The more we put our hope and our trust and our faith in money so that our future will be okay, the more that we will always think, I have to have more or I'm not settled or I don't have enough, the more we'll be bothered by that. And yet, the more we give money away, the more we say that this money is not God, and the more we, we endeavor as a body of believers to use what we have for the purposes of God in this world, the more that it seems that we have. It doesn't make sense, but God's economy is not the same as our economy. God's understanding is not the same as our understanding. So I would challenge us to 
obviously we're, we're, we're here on the second Sunday of Easter testifying to the fact that Christ is resurrected. And, and this message isn't one about make sure y'all give as much as you can to the church. This message is one is let's make sure that we are the church as much as we can be, that we model for others this New Testament kind of faith, that we come together as a family and that and this is the the church is that great place where you don't get paid but you get to do all the work. And usually that's not where we want to be. We want to be where we can get paid. But if we say that our payment is in heaven, perhaps also we're doing it for the wrong reason. We're doing it we're we're working for the for the good of the church for the good of our community, the good of the society, even of the whole nation and the world, we do that together because we want to testify that the gospel is true, that Jesus is risen, but also because we're a part of recreating what it means to be a family. God is not done with this earth. He has a resurrection plan for every dead, sinful desire, every thought, everything that has gone by the wayside, everything we look to and point to and say, God is not in this. He has a plan that those things will be resurrected and transformed by His grace and for His glory. And you know what that plan is? It's the church. It's you and me. It's the believers and followers of Jesus Christ who would be willing to do that. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way back forward. And I want to remind us that this is, not, uh, uh, this is not meant to be a message about giving to your church. It's not meant to be a message to make you feel guilty about having money in your bank account. This is a message that, uh, about being the church, being called together as a new family, because we have a job to do. We are meant to transform the world from the inside out. Sometimes we look to the future and we say, well, God is going to wipe it all away and start over again. And some people think it's going to be 2033 in June. I don't personally believe that's the case. I also believe that God is remaking heaven and earth, as Revelation says. And perhaps the way that God is going to do that is through the church. Sorry, God is remaking the world through us. So the church is not an escape plan for the, from the world. We don't come here to find refuge from, from the world. We don't come here to hide. We don't come here because we need to get away. We come here to be informed and challenged, stretched, stretched and transformed so that we can sent, be sent out and be God's salvation plan for the world. Let's pray. Father, we we see how you're working in the world. We see your fingerprints and your footprints everywhere we look because we are people of faith. And we know that good things don't just happen by accident. And so we give you glory and praise for all you've done in our lives, all that has brought us to be in this place this morning. We know that your grace came before us and called us to you even before we knew you. And so we thank you Thank you, Lord. Also in this time, we don't want to just come and, and be the same. We want to be transformed into your image. We want to be brought together and, and, and built up as a community of faith that with our very existence, we testify that Jesus Christ is risen. We don't want to look at the world and say, well, God's going to wipe it away anyway. We don't want to look at the world and say, the, the world is God's problem. We don't want to look out at our neighbors and those who are suffering and say, someone will get to them. Or that's just the way that the world is. Rather than that, Lord, we want to be people who take part in your creative remaking of the world. We know that this is a big task and we don't look to it lightly. But Lord, we, we trust you that if we would endeavor to reach out to look beyond ourselves that others will be called into this family. Not a worldly family where we think of I, 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 I focus upon my children or my loved ones or my relatives or, or brothers and sisters or siblings or whoever we're talking about, Lord. We want to focus on all those who call upon your name. And if there are those who need to be adopted into the family of Christ this morning, Lord, 
we trust you to bring them to us. If there's anyone in this in this sanctuary this morning who has not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, Lord, bring them to the altar. We don't keep our eyes closed in that time. We keep our eyes open to know who is joining our family that we may follow up with them. I pray that if anyone's following along online, Lord, whether it be a month from now or this afternoon or in this moment, Lord, if they need to make a decision for you, that they would reach out to us and let us know. We want to be good family members, hospitable, gift-giving, and loving family members, Lord. We want to testify to your goodness with every action and every program and every uh, meeting that we have, Lord. Build us up into your family.
Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Father, this morning we just thank you for our time together. Jesus is risen. And we want our worship this morning to be a confirmation that we won't make that celebration start and stop on Easter Sunday. You're the one that guides and comforts us. So as we come back to our, whatever will become our new normal, we just want to be open to whatever way you might guide us. Father, we worship you. We trust you. And we know that you will make a way like only you can. We put all our faith in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. I fall apart. You're the 